Amen. Hey, we're finishing the book of John today. We're in John chapter 21. Again, next week we'll be starting the Ten Commandments. And the title of my message this morning is the epilogue of John. Now, what's an epilogue? Well, Webster defines, uh, defines epilogue as something that's at the end of the book that makes a comment on, 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 on that book or makes a comment and is discussing something at the end of the book. And so we're going to look at some comments by John in John chapter 21, the epilogue of John. Now, it's, it, the verses right before John 21, it seems like John's ending the book. Look at verses 30 and 31 of John chapter 20. It says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That'd be a good place in the book, wouldn't it? It's talking about the book was written so that you believe, and believing you might have life in his name. So why does he do a whole other chapter? Well, there's a couple reasons. One is because uh, he's going to talk about in this chapter the restoration of Peter as a foundational leader for the New Testament church. You know why that's important? Because what did, what did Jesus do right before the cross? On the night of Jesus' arrest, what did Peter do? He denied the Lord three times. And there was actually a, a church tradition that says there would be people, as I talked about earlier, that would follow Peter around as he did his ministry, doing rooster crows that were the enemies of the cross and enemies of Christ. They'd be making fun of Peter. Do, 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 do. They'd do it right behind him in the marketplace and other places. And so people were making fun of his leadership. And so we're going to see why Peter was a foundational leader for the New Testament church. And the reason why he's a foundational leader for the New Testament church? Because Jesus made him that. Jesus is going to restore him here in this chapter, chapter 21. And so John is addressing this issue. Even though Peter denied the Lord, you know, three times on the greatest needed, uh, hour of his need, the night he's going to be uh, crucified, we see in God's grace that Jesus is going to restore Peter to a primary, important, foundational role for the New Testament church. And John wants to include this because he's answering the question of some people, why is Peter one of the pillars of the New Testament church? I mean, denied the Lord three times. One of the reasons why? Because God is a God of restoration. Did you know that? God's into restoring and fixing. It doesn't matter sometimes the mistakes we make. What matters is we come back to him and we let him use us again. Proverbs, great verse, 24, 16, says that the, the, the righteous man falls seven times. And then what does he do? rises again. That's a God we have. God is a God of not only the second chance, he's a God of the hundred chance. He's the God of the thousand chance. And we see that. We're going to see that today in the life of Peter. And, and I love that about our, our God. God. God believes in us so much so that even after we fail, if we repent and we confess and we get things right, he rises us up again, he dusts us off, and he uses us again in spite of ourselves. And we're going to see that in the story of Peter this morning. But there's another reason why um, this epilogue is necessary. There's a rumor out there in the church about John. The rumor was that John wasn't going to die until the rapture. Now, it's a good thing we don't have rumors in churches today, right? <laughs> Doesn't happen at all, does it? Yeah, it does. And Mark Twain said this. He said, said, rumors could travel around the world while truth is still getting its laces on. And Mark Twain knew that, by the way, because Mark Twain uh, went on a ship in the uh, 1800s before there was internet, before there was CNN, before there was, you know, TV and stuff. He went on a ship to Europe, and while he was in Europe, the newspapers here in the United States got this rumor that he had died in Europe, and then he came back on a ship, and he was, there, all the newspapers said he was dead. And then he got interviewed by those newspapers, and he said this. He said, this, the rumor of my death has been greatly exaggerated. And so when there's rumors, check the rumors out. Make sure there's validity be, be, besides just being a rumor mill where it goes through the church. And that's what John is addressing here because John is making it clear that Jesus didn't necessarily say he was going to live until the, uh, Jesus came back to the rapture. And he's going to clarify that at the end of this chapter. Uh, part of the reason why they were believing that too is because all the other apostles uh, had been martyred except for John. They tried to kill John, a couple of Roman emperors. One tried to uh, poison him. Another Roman emperor, Domitian, actually put him in a boiling pot of oil, and he came out unscathed, not one blister. And that's why, that's why he was uh, exiled to the island of Patmos. But God had a purpose for him, exiled to the island of Patmos in his 90s, because what did he have to write? The last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And on the Lord's Day, at Patmos, in his 90s, he got the Revelation vision, and that's when he wrote the book of Revelation. 
So there's a purpose in him living into his 90s. By the way, they also thought that John was never going to die because the average life expectancy of a male in the Roman Empire was 45 to 50 years old, and the dude was in his 90s. He had doubled the life expectancy. So this rumor was spreading around, John's not going to die. He's going to live all the way until the rapture. John's going to clear that up this morning too. So church, ready to study it? John chapter 21? Let's, let's dig right in. John chapter 21. It says this, After this, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, Sea of Tiberias is synonymous with the Sea of Galilee. It was, it was changed to Tiberias because one of the Roman emperors was Tiberius. He wanted the Sea of Galilee named after him, so they changed it to Sea of Tiberias. And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and the two other of his disciples were together. So 70 apostles were together now in Galilee. And Simon Peter said to him, I'm going fishing. And they said, and we will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat. And that night, notice, they caught nothing. Now question, why did they catch nothing? These guys were professional fishermen. These guys had to own the fishing business. And they're out all night long trying to catch fish. And they caught nothing. One of the reasons why they caught nothing is because Jesus had told them to go to Galilee to a mountain and just wait for him there. We know that back in Matthew chapter 28, verse 7, it says this. It says, go quickly, tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead, and behold, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, and behold, I have told you. And then in verse 16 of that same chapter, he says, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. He designated this mountain for them to go to and just wait for him. But what did these fishermen do? Go back to fishing. Peter said, I'm going fishing. Going back to business as usual, not being directed by the Lord to just stay at the mountain and wait. And you know what happens? When we make our own plans and they're not directed by the Lord, oftentimes they're not going to be blessed. This guy's fished all night and got nothing. And you know what? But the opposite is true too. When you make your plans directed by the Lord, the Lord's going to bless. And we'll see that in just a minute. The mind of man plans his way, Proverbs 16, 9 says. The mind of man plans his ways, but the what? The Lord directs his steps. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and then he'll make your path straight. We'll see that. They're going to catch a whole boatload of fish as they're directed by the Lord. But they caught nothing when they were doing it in their flesh, and they weren't following the directives of God. You know what I've seen in the last 35 years or 38 years of walking with the Lord? I can make my own plans, do my own thing, and then ask the Lord to bless it, and oftentimes it won't be. Or I could be directed by the Lord, seek first his kingdom and righteousness, go the way the directive of the Lord is, and it will be blessed because I'm going in his direction. So it's a lot better just to get the flow. Get with the flow of God's will and God's direction, and you don't have to ask him to bless it because you're going his way, and it will be blessed. You see the difference? And so it goes on now. Verse 4, but when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Why didn't they know it was Jesus? Because they're 100 yards away, probably early morning, probably mist on the water. They couldn't see clearly yet, so they didn't know it was Jesus. Verse 5, so Jesus said to them, children, you don't have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. So typical question, how's the fishing? You don't got nothing, do you? <laughs> A lot of fish stories out there, right? Verse 6, and he said to them, cast the net on the right hand on the side of the boat, you'll find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, th that disciple whom Jesus left, led, loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So what do they do now? They listen to Jesus now. They take the directive of Jesus. They take the, even though it didn't make sense, Sometimes the Lord directs us to do things that don't even make sense, but we do it anyways. And as you do it, he takes the net, just puts it on the other side of the boat, and what happens? They get a boatload of fish. It says later in the story, 153 fish. And, and they were so excited, they count, counted every one of them. 153 fish. Boatload of fish, because they were going with the direction of the Lord. Now, how does John, the disciple whom we love, knows this is Jesus? Go back to Luke chapter 5, and a similar thing happened to them in Luke chapter 5 at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Let's read it together. Luke chapter 5. It says, verse 1, Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around Jesus and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is, by the way, also the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats laying, lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. 
And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. And he asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water, let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night long and caught nothing, but I'll do as you say and let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. Similar story. And, and Peter saying, we've been fishing all night, we're done. She said, no, 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 go out, put the nets out again. And they, and they follow the directive of Jesus and what happens? They get a boatload of fish. So now they've done the same thing three years later at the end of Jesus' ministry, at the resurrection, and Jesus is speaking, giving directives again, put out your net on the other side of the boat, put it out on the other side of the boat, pull a load of fish, and John goes, it's the Lord. How do they know it's the Lord? Because he's done it again. He did it previously. And so it says now, so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. Don't you love Peter? He says, these other guys, they'll roll the boat in. I ain't waiting. I relate to Peter. I'm that kind of guy too. If you know Pastor John at all, I like getting things done yesterday. And Peter's like, I ain't going to wait for you guys to roll us in. That's the Lord. I'm going to go meet with the Lord. And he jumps right in, the, right, right in the Sea of Galilee and swims to Jesus. Maybe he tried to walk on the water initially. What do you think? Maybe he did that earlier with Jesus. Jesus presence. walk on the water. Let me try that again. Sink. And he probably just swam all the way in. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards, 100 yards of football field. So a football field away from Jesus, dragging the net full of fish. And so when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. I love Jesus. What does he do before they even get to the shore? He's making them breakfast. He's, you know, he's got the wood out. He's got the fire going. He's got some other fish already cooking. And so when they get off the boat, breakfast is ready for his disciples. You know what made Jesus a great leader? He was a great servant. And he said this, the greatest among you shall be a servant. And he served them over the three years of ministry over and over and over again. On the night that he was going to be arrested, to be brought away, to be crucified, he served them. He had a Passover meal with them. He got on his knees and he washed dirty feet. Amazing. God in the flesh washing dirty feet. Repeatedly throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus over and over again serving and serving and serving. And you know what? You want to be a great leader? Be a great servant. Greatest among you. What makes you great in God's kingdom? being a servant. You know, we had a memorial service for a good friend of mine Friday night, Keith Lindler. He was uh, one of our, our main campus overseer for years here on campus. Passed away in the last month or two. And it was an amazing time of remembrance. We, we saw a whole video at the beginning of the memorial service of him in the Philippines trip where he spent a whole couple of weeks in the Philippines with Pastor Jerry, founder of U-Turn, and Pastor Steve. They went over there and just served people on the island of the Philippines. And it's a great tribute to Keith. But at the end of the memorial service, we had an open mic. And at the open mic, we had just a bunch of people come up, a bunch of people come up. And it was amazing because a lot of these people are coming up, all, primarily mostly U-Turn guys that Keith had served. He had a little nickname for all his U-Turn guys. It was Pookie. He called everybody Pookie. Hey, Pookie, come over here. Everybody was kind of laughing, remembering Keith's Pookie. But the biggest thing that I, that I was struck by, as I was just sitting out in these chairs, listening to the testimonies about Keith, is Keith was a servant. For years, he served on this campus. One of the guys said that when Keith was the main overseer of this campus, this campus was like a Swiss watch. Just ran like smooth because he served so much, make sure everything was fine on this campus. Everything was locked down. Everything was clean. Everything was good. But they also talked about how a lot of these guys' lives were changed because when they came into U-turn, Keith was there serving them. And I, at the end of the open mic time, I didn't want to come up here. I felt like I, I'm up on the stage plenty. I, I don't need to. At the, end of, at the end of the open mic time, I came up because the Lord just told me to come up. And I came up. And the only thing I could say, I started losing a little bit. And the only thing I could say, Keith was a great man because he was a great servant. 
The greatest among you shall be a servant. And Keith was great. Parents, let me tell you something. You want to be a great parent? Serve your kids. Serve them. And serve them well. And that doesn't end when they get out of preschool, okay? That doesn't end when they even get out of high school. Now, i got kids that are all grown up and moved away on us, but we're still called to serve our kids through the rest of their lives. And one of the, one of the, one of the things that will make you a great parent is being a great servant, putting their needs before your needs, right? It says in the Bible, in Philippians chapter 2, have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, who although exists in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to grasp, but he emptied himself, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in the likeness of man. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. We follow a Savior that was a servant, and so we're supposed to be servants too, Amen. Serve some people this week. Serve your kids. Serve people at work. Serve people that you lead. And you tell you what, the greatest leaders in the world today, not only in the church, but in the business world, in the community, the greatest leaders are the greatest servants. Amen? And that's what Jesus was doing. He was making fish for his disciples after he rose from the grave and building a fire. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land, full of large fish. Here it is, 153 fish. That's a catch. And although there were so many, the net was not yet torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. You know, interesting, Heidi and I's favorite breakfast place right now is a place called Eggs Up Grill. We got a new one right here in Lexington. If you look at the wall at Eggs Up Grill, they quote Jesus in this verse. It says, come away and have breakfast. And so next time you're there, check it out. John chapter 21, verse 12. And none of the disciples ventured to question him, Who are you? No, and it was the Lord. And then Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. Now this is the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, third time to the group of disciples. He's, he's appeared already to Mary Magdalene and some other people individually, but this is the third time he's appeared to the whole group of disciples. Now look what he does with Peter. Fascinating interchange here. Verse 15. And so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And he said to Peter, shepherd my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Now, a couple of things you need to understand to understand this passage. First of all, uh, when Jesus says, do you love me? The word in the Greek is agape. It's a divine love. It's an unconditional love. It's a selfless love. It's a sacrificial love. It's the love of Christ. And it's a heavenly love that's, that's going to love no matter what, whether it's been given to or returned or not. It's going to love no matter what. And so Jesus asked Peter, do you love me this way? And what does Peter say? In the Greek, he says, Lord, I phileo you. Now, that's another word. It's a, it's a word for brotherly love, fond affection, a family kind of love. And Peter says, yeah, I, I love you with a fond affection, Lord, with a friendship love. But he doesn't respond, I love you with a Christ-like, divine, unconditional, selfless, sacrificial love. And then Jesus asked him a second time, Peter, do you agape me? Peter says, no. Or he doesn't say no. He says, Lord, I phileo you. Again, I have a friendship love for you. I have a fond affection for you, but he doesn't say agape. Why is he not going to that other level and say, I agape you? What did Peter do on the night of Jesus' arrest? He said, if all these other disciples desert you, you say we're all going to desert you. If they all desert you, I will never desert you. I will never do what you say in, in denying you. And what did Peter do? Denied him not once, but twice and three times. So what has Peter learned? He lear he's learning to be humble here. He's learning to not say something that he can't fulfill. He's learning to be careful. And that's a good lesson for us because sometimes we see people fall, we see people make mistakes. I'll never do that. He who thinks he stands better take heed lest he fall. And we need to stay humble. Peter said it this way very well. In 1 Peter, he talks about humility 
And he says in 1 Peter, uh, uh, it says this. It says, you younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, for God is opposed to what? But he gives grace to who? And, and then he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. You've got to stay humble, church, because if you don't stay humble, you're headed for a fall. How do I know that? Proverbs tells us that. It says in the book of Proverbs that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Another verse, a uh, translation that says, uh, a haughty spirit goes before a fall. If you want to fall, just think, I'm too good to be able to, that person might make that mistake, but I'm too good to make that mistake. Ooh, careful. You know, we've had a lot of falls lately. A lot of pastors have fallen lately. It's breaking my heart. Well, the pastor of the largest Calvary Chapel in the world, just in the last couple of years, fell morally, broke my heart. The pastor of the largest church in the state of South Carolina, just in the last uh, month or two, has fallen morally and got fired from his church. Breaks my heart. And one of the things the Lord's been laying on my heart, as I see not only pastors, but I see some close friends of mine lately have fallen, made some big mistakes. And what the Lord's laid on my heart is, accept the grace of God. There go you, John. Stay humble. Keep your guard up. Be careful. Be careful. And that's a word for all of us. Amen? Because when you start thinking you got it all figured out, and you're, no, I'm never going to do that, be careful. God's opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's the first lesson we learned from this interchange. Peter's not over-promising. He's being careful now. He's saying, I phileo you, but I can't say agape you. He's being careful. He's being humble. Second thing we learn here, interesting, go back to our story in John chapter 21. Jesus three times asked Peter a question. What, is the th what does he ask him? Three times. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Now, why is he being repetitive in that way? Because he's given Peter an opportunity three times to say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Why is that important? How many times did, did Peter deny Jesus Christ? Three times. So three times now Jesus is restoring Peter and saying, I'm a savior of restoration. I'm a savior that's going to give you opportunities to affirm me just as you denied me. Peter, we're going to get this thing right. So three times Peter is now able to say, I love you, I love you, I love you. You know, God's a God of restoration. He doesn't care what you've done or what you've been into in regards to his grace and forgiveness and his mercy can cover it. We need to believe that. One of the things that's kept me going for 38 years of walking with the Lord is I, be, I believe strongly in the grace of God. And the times I fail, when the accuser comes in and he tries to condemn me, I go back to the fact there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And God's grace can cover any dumb thing I do. I just need to go to the throne of grace, get it right, and start over again with him, and he will restore me. And that's what he's doing right now for Peter. Three times. I, I love you, I love you, I love you. Peter's being restored. Wonderful. But also, he's being restored to leadership. Notice what he says. He says, well, if you love me, tend my lambs. If you love me, shepherd my sheep. If you love me, tend my sheep. He's putting him back in his position of being a shepherd over God's sheep. And that's what his position became. And he became one of the pillars of the New Testament church that took care of God's sheep by feeding them, protecting them, and giving them the word of God. Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. He says, therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, a partaker also of the glory that's to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercise an oversight under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eager, eagerness, not lording it over as those who have allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. That's Peter at the end of his life. Sam, I've learned to be a shepherd. And Jesus put me in this position of being a shepherd. 
And some of you are saying, well, that has nothing to do with me because I don't want your job, John. I don't want to be a pastor, and I don't even want to be an elder. So what does this have to do with me? Hey, if you're a parent, you're called to be a shepherd. You're supposed to be the shepherd, shepherd the sheep in your family. Tend those lambs. Disciple them well. Lead them by example. That's what parents are supposed to do. And that's a word for a culture where the culture, the, the more and more we're getting from the culture, parents just want to be their kids' friends instead of their parents. And I'm all for being your kids' friends, but I'm more for parents being parents and leading their kids and guiding their kids and diligently setting an example for their kids. You see that? Parents, if you've got kids in the home still, you've got 18 years of shepherding them diligently, good examples giving them the word of God, bringing them to church, leading them in God's ways. And then after they get out of the house, you got the rest of their lives to continue to be a guide, continue to be a shepherd, and continue to be a leader in their lives. All my kids are grown and gone, but I'm still their shepherd. I'm still the one that they look to as a father to lead them well, and I'm gonna keep shepherding them, and you should too. Interesting, if you're a Christian, you're called to be a shepherd in some ways, and just your example in the workplace, in their neighborhoods, you're called to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And that involves shepherding people towards the truth and guiding them in the ways of God. We're all called to do that. Shepherd God's sheep. Okay, now let's look now at the interchange with, uh, with Peter about John. Verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish. Verse 18, but when you grow old, this is to Peter, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said in signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Now this is predictive, this is prophetic by Jesus, and he's saying to Peter, it's coming a time, Peter, when you're older, you're gonna be girded up, just like I was on the cross. And they're gonna bring you to a place you don't wanna go. And we, we know from church history, Peter, at the end of his life, was arrested, brought to Rome, put in a dungeon for nine months, according to the church fathers, chained to a pole. And then after nine months, he was brought out of the dungeon up to the hill where they crucified people in Rome. And as he was walking up that hill, he said, I'm not worthy to die the death that my Savior and Lord Jesus Christ died. And he asked to be crucified upside down, and he was. And I could just see, after he breathe his last breath, I could just see Jesus in heaven welcoming Peter, saying, well done, Peter, good and faithful servant. Enter now the joy of your master. Peter, you messed up with those three denials, but you got it right at the end. You died for me. And there's special crowns, according to the scripture, special crowns in heaven, rewards for those that have been martyred for the cause of Christ. And I could just see Jesus putting on Peter's head a crown, saying, well done. You know, it's not about uh, how you start the Christian life. It's about how you finish. It's not about a sprint. I've seen a lot of Christians just sprint out of the gates and be on fire for Christ for a season and then just mess up. The people that get it right are the people that say, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. I'm going to be like Paul that said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I'm going to keep the faith. I'm going to finish well. And again, some of my heroes, spiritually, are those that are finishing well. I think of Billy Graham. The dude's 97 years old. He can't even get out of bed, according to Franklin Graham. But you know what he's doing with all his spare time now in bed? He's praying for this country and praying for this world. He's become a prayer warrior. And he's fighting right into the end fighting for the kingdom of God. I think of Pastor Chuck, the founder of Calvary Chapel. He died just a few years ago. He got lung cancer, even though he never smoked one cigarette in his whole life. It's part of living in L.A., I think. It's called smog. But he got lung cancer at the very end. And as he was fighting the lung cancer, chemo, radiation, all that kind of stuff, he didn't stop fighting. He was in the pulpit teaching the Word of God with oxygen tanks. The Sunday before he died on that Wednesday, he was teaching three services on Sunday morning, and Sunday night, and then the Monday before he died on Wednesday, he was doing his call and radio show, serving the Lord. Because he said, I'm going to finish well. That guy's a hero. And he, he received, just like Peter, well done, good and faithful servant, enter now into the joy of your master. 
And that's what Peter's going to be doing here. He's going to be girded up and martyred for the cause of Christ. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, verse 20, following them, and the one also who had leaned back on his bosom at the supper said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? And so Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, this is pointing to John now, Lord, what about this man? I love Peter. He never got rid of the the foot-in-the-mouth disease. He's like, okay, I'm going to die on a cross or I'll be girded up, but what about this guy over here? What about this guy John? What's going to happen with him? And look what Jesus says. Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Here's the rumor. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say to him he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? See what's going on there? He's not saying he's going to live forever until the rapture. What he's saying here is that keep your eyes on your own walk, Peter. Don't talk about other people. Just focus on what I've called you to do. And that's all Jesus was saying. So let's close up the Gospel of John now, verse 24. This is the disciple who's testifying to these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. He's talking about himself. I'm the one, John, that wrote these things. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which, which if the, they were written in details, I suppose that even the world itself would not even contain the books that would be written. You see what John's saying there? He's saying, I'm just giving you a snippet of all the miracles, all the incredible things that Jesus did in his three years of public ministry. But if we wrote everything he did, the books of the world wouldn't even contain all that Jesus did. And not only that, John is implying too, Jesus is going to do more. And how is Jesus going to do more miracles? Through his body. Who's his body? We're his hands. We're his feet. We're his body. So church, this week, so we go out to the highways and hedges. Let's be his body. Let's be his hands, his feet. Let's take some of those brochures and put them in some people's hands that are lost, that are unchurched, that need the light and the salt of truth and grace and salvation. Lord, Lord, use us this week. Use us this week to be your city set on a hill. Lord, use us this week to be your light and your truth to some people. Use us this week to bring some miracles to some people of salvation possibly because we're reaching out to them in Jesus' name. Amen? God does his miracles today through the church. The church is the hope of the world. We're the city set on a hill. We're his light. So my prayer is that God will use this church this week and you people to bring some light to some people this week. And also I want to close this morning by saying some of you here this morning might relate well to the falling of Peter because you're distant from God right now. You've wandered a little bit. There's some space between you and God and your relationship with God. And You know what the Bible says about that? The Bible says God has never left you. The Bible says God will never leave you nor forsake you. The Bible says very clearly, if you draw near to God, He'll draw near to you. But you can move. He doesn't move, but you can. And what I think God might be saying to a few people this morning is, come home. Get right. And how do you do that? Confession. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, will forgive our sins, and then he'll purify us from all unrighteousness. Another way you get, get, come home and come back to God too is repentance. What's repentance? It's turning. Saying, enough. I'm going to quit going in this wrong direction. I'm going to go in the right direction. I'm going to quit going the world's way. I'm going to go God's way. Some of you here this morning might need to make that decision and say, I'm done. I'm done just wandering away. And our, our hearts are prone to wander. They are. But the good thing about our God is he's a God of restoration. He's a father that loves us so much that when we come home, he celebrates. The Bible says when one sinner repents, all of heaven rejoices. That's cool. Party. There's a rejoicing in heaven when we get things right. So maybe during this time of prayer, you might need to get some things right. Let the Lord do that. Let the Lord do that through you and in, in you. Well, let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word this morning, God. Your word is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, Lord. Your word is true. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. It even judges the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts, Lord. Father, help us, first of all, to be a church that's 
your, your light this week, God. Help us to be a church full of people that are ambassadors for Christ and are inviting people to come out and be a part of what you're doing in your church, God. Help us not to be ashamed of your gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to whoever believes. Help us to be heralding that gospel even this week, God. And Father, I pray too that, that um, if there are people here this morning that need to get right with you, Lord, people that need to come back to you, God, and they've been wandering, people that have experienced your love and your grace and already been saved, but they've kind of distanced themselves from you, God. Father, I, I, I believe all throughout your word you make it clear that you love them and you're ready to receive them back. I think of Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22. It says, Return, you backslidden children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. So if you're here this morning and you just feel distant from God, but you want to get right, you want to just receive prayer that you might draw near to God again and come home. I encourage you to do that in your hearts. And I don't even want to pray for you this morning. And let's do this. We do this Wednesday night also. Let's do it today. If you feel like you need to get some things right and just come back to God, why don't you just stand up right now and I'll pray for you. And be bold in doing that and just say, I, I've been distant. Praise the Lord right here in the middle. Praise the Lord here on the side, on the sides. Praise the Lord, a whole group of people right here. Praise the Lord. God loves you. Praise the Lord in the back middle. You feel like you're coming back and you need to come back. Stand up right now and I'll pray for you. Get some things right. Do some business with God this morning. Don't be afraid to do that. Praise the Lord. Okay, here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you. And I want the people around you just to put a hand towards you or a hand on you and agree with me in this prayer. So if you see people, anybody standing around you, put a hand on them if they're close to you, and, and pray for them. Or just put your hand up and towards them, maybe, and pray for them. Don't be afraid to do that. Just put a hand on a shoulder. Pray for those people that are around. Father, we thank you so much for these people that are making decisions to, to come back to you, God. You're a God of restoration. You're a God of forgiveness. You're a God of peace. And so, Father, I pray for all these individuals that this might be a time of them just saying, I confess these things that have been holding me back from you, God. And God, I want you to not only forgive me, I want you to give me the power of the Holy Spirit to give me victory in these areas, God. And Father, I pray that you would help these individuals just to say, enough, enough going the wrong way. I'm going the right way. I'm going God's way. And not only that, I'm forsaking that and I trust you, God, that you, you've forgiven me of this. I'm confessing it. And I'm receiving your forgiveness. I'm asking you to purify me from these areas in my life. Father, bring victory. Where there's been defeat, Lord, bring victory. Where there's been weakness, Lord, bring strength. Bring your power, Lord. By the blood of Jesus, I pray for this, God. Thank you so much, Lord, for how much you love every single person that's standing. You love them so much. You've got plans for them, God plans for a future and a hope. Just give them faith, Lord. Give them hope. Give them your love, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.